for change in a society is usually persona non grata for those who have been the beneficiaries of the system. So excited for today's edition of On the Record. We've got an amazing guest. Uh, we are going to talk about academia, the future, and also what it feels like to be the president of an amazing institution. Joining me for this Black Girl Magic conversation is Carmen Tori Ambar. She is the president of Oberlin College and Conservatory. She is the 15th president of the college. And not only that, she is the first African-American to lead this institution in nearly 200 years. That is two centuries, y'all. So this is an important conversation, and I'm so excited to be talking with you today. So welcome to On the Record. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Last night, you, along with uh, five other powerful, amazing uh, black women presidents, uh, joined American Urban Radio Network as our guest at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Yes. I wasn't there upon your entrance, but please just let us know how it felt coming through those doors with six amazing black women leading predominantly white institutions in this establishment where we weren't always welcomed. You know, it was empowering. I think it was a sense of sisterhood and this kind of collective sense of, of accomplishment. Um, but also, I think, a challenge, too, because it's mm. challenging times for college presidents in general, but uh, certainly for women leading these institutions uh, and then black women. So I think that there was both a combination of the joy of it and the pride of it, but also recognizing that we're in this perilous time. Ooh. And some of it was about uh, being that image for the next generation of young women to let them know that, yes, these jobs are challenging, but they're also joyous, and we want them to aspire to them. So I think there's pressure on institutions because of the changing landscape of higher education, the financial pressures for institutions, mm. the politicization of, of college campuses in general, yes, around diversity and equity and inclusion, but now the current uh, sort of uprising around Palestinian plight, Israel, Gaza. I think that leading in this time is... Um, both challenging, but also rewarding if you can be steadfast. And I think that's part of what bringing that group of women together was about, about helping them be um, able to withstand the challenges of it because they know that there's a sisterhood and there's someone out there who is rooting for their success and understands the challenges and burdens in a way that you really can't unless you are a historic first. You said so much there that I want to touch on, but one is how do you, how have you been able to in this role um, craft safe spaces for students? I know that on one thing that you have done, you have the Presidential Initiative on Race, Equity, and Inclusion. Talk about that first. You know, it, it, I thought it was important after the murder of George Floyd to be clear about uh, Oberlin's commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion. So Oberlin has this historic uh, uh, place in higher education. We were the first institution to admit African Americans through an official policy, right? So lots of people sometimes refer to Oberlin as the other historically black college because we were admitting African Americans in the mid 1800s. But it was important um, uh, upon the murder of George Floyd to just make sure that people understand that that mission is still relevant today. And so we launched this center. Uh, we just hired a new director. And I think it was particularly important as people started to pull back from DEI for Oberlin to say clearly that this is not only important for Oberlin, but it's important for the world. Uh, and it really sprang out of our students saying, you know, we want to feel like we are affirmed and matter more. We want the ecosystem at Oberlin to reflect a place where everyone feels like they matter and everyone feels like they're affirmed. And I think that through this center, we'll be able to do that more effectively for all students. You know, sometimes people think diversity and inclusion is for the students who are bringing the diversity. The truth of the matter is, the entire campus is better 
-hmm. when everyone feels like they are affirmed and everyone feels like they matter. And I'm hopeful that this center, through the research that the students would do, through the opportunities to bring faculty research together and to elevate that research, that we will all help the institution do this work better and hopefully be a beacon for other institutions to know how to do this work well. Colleges have always been a place where we have seen a lot of protest, a lot of movements. Um, students have always been active in movements, and you talked about what's happening in Palestine, what is happening uh, in, in Israel, and we see the arrests and, and the, the, the encampments that are going, various campuses. How do you feel, what do you feel should be the place of colleges and universities in this, in this international discussion that we're seeing, and especially since we saw the resignation of Claudine Gay at Harvard University. Like, she's dealing with that, and, and at the same time, Arlen is, I'm seeing this black woman right. on display, and, I, and I'm seeing the issues at the same time, but it, it is, it's a lot. It is a lot. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that's so true about what's happening on our, our college campuses is that the complexities of the world have come to these institutions of higher education. And one of the things I think is frustrating for lots of college presidents is the notion that somehow the geopolitical complexities of the world should be solved on these college campuses. <laughs> right, it's like, right, you, know, right. there are, you know, Biden hasn't been able to do it, Netanyahu hasn't been able to do it. I'm not quite sure how the presidents of these institutions are uh, gonna solve right. it. That's such a good point. Yeah, and I think that, that where I am on it is that, um, we are fundamentally institutions of education. And so the goal here is to see if we can educate our students. Can we have more conversations across difference? Can we do that effectively? Can we hear from people who have different viewpoints? Can we do it with civility? Can we do it with a caring concern for each other? So on our campus, we spend a lot of time trying to do that. And I think one of the things we have to really uh, accept is that lots of college presidents are dealing with campuses that are in environments where they have people who are not part of their campuses coming on to those campuses, right. sort of helping to stir the pot. Uh, and so, you know, I have real sympathy for those presidents because I know what it means to sit in this seat. Uh, one of the things I say to our students all the time is that, um, you know, uh, it's really true that uh, I have constraints too. Right. <laughs> we are not all seen, all knowing and, and able right. to solve every challenge. And so, um, if we can find a little grace for these presidents who are trying to deal with a complicated environment, um, and of course trying to balance safety with freedom of expression, um, those values that we all agree with, um, but if we can try to add some ability to help them do it with civility and with community in mind, and without this critique that suggests that because they haven't solved the world's geopolitical issues, that somehow they are failing in their presidencies. I just don't think that's a fair critique. Mm. You know, in this space that you are in, every time when we know we're, I got the word that we were having, the um, presidents come in, black women presidents come in, I just thought, like, we're about to see six unicorns walk through the door. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, because talk about the, the rarity that we see. And what comes to mind is that, especially working in the White House, we're always hearing the numbers quoted. Black women um, are the most educated, right? Mm -hmm. Not only are we the most educated, we're starting businesses faster than anyone. We're one of the largest, um, fastest growing population of entrepreneurs. And then when we get in the academic space, if we're the largest number of, like, PhDs, fastest growing number of PhDs, we don't see that we don't see that representation right. at the top. And so what does that do for women coming in? How does that broaden the conversation? How what are some of the challenges that you challenges that you face in this position that you are in? You know, I think it's interesting because I think whenever you're a historic first, um, it really takes some time for the campus to be prepared for what it means to have someone who's different. And that's part of the challenge, right? How does the campus respond to this different thing? Um, I too um, have- Well, how have they? You know, I think that, you know, because of Oberlin's historic kind of commitment to diversity and inclusion, I think there was more fertile ground for me. Okay. And I think people understood it a little bit more. But it's not to say that it didn't face any challenges or people 
um, you know, sometimes questioning, you know, competence and, um, and my vision um, that seemed like it had undercurrents of things that weren't really about the typical critique. And I think one of the things you have to do when you're facing that um, is to, you know, do what our ancestors have always done, which is to be clear about who you are and to help the campus come along to that sense of confidence and clarity about uh, what you do as a, a leader. Uh, and over time, I think people have come to respect me. I think they didn't respect me at first, but they've come to very much respect me. And also to accept that I'm doing the best that I can mm -hmm. and to give me some grace because this work is not as easy as it looks from the outside. Uh, and I think over time, people have come to accept that. Uh, but the challenge in this environment is that college presidents are not just dealing with their campus community. They're dealing with Congress people. They're dealing with municipalities. They're right. dealing with people who are um, not of the culture of a college campus uh, and are also bringing their own perspectives and their own views and, frankly, their own agendas. Uh, mm. Uninterested in really trying to accomplish something um, that is about the institution, but they're bringing their own agenda to the table. And I think as we look at what's happening with college presidents today, we just should keep that in mind that um, there are multiple agendas in that called those congressional hearings and Absolutely. on those college campuses that don't have much to do with really ensuring that those campuses are thriving and vibrant in all the right ways. I think we see that even when we look at the banning of books all over. Yes. Yes. Right. And 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 the challenges against black thought that has so governed um, our culture and and even I say stealing vocabulary from black culture, like the term woke. That bothers me so much when we have seen people redefine what it is always meant and then um, uh, make judgments on campuses and education. It is it is. It is such a confusing atmosphere sometimes to just maintain um, what has helped your people come so far. You know, it's so funny you say that because one of the conversations I was having with the college presidents was about the use of the term DEI um, and whether we can use that term anymore oh. in, in an effective way. Does it, by its very nature, by its very nature, turn people off? Um, and one of the college presidents was so poignant when she described, you know, we spent years and we say we, not just black folks, right. but all types of folks, right. um, emphasizing diversity and inclusion, building infrastructures that help us do that well, because this is a value that we've all believed in. And um, it felt like in a matter of days, seeing it dismantled. Literally. Uh, and the words used to mean something negative. Right. Uh, and so I just think we have to be a little bit stalwart here and to, to take those definitions back and to say, oh, this is, you know, you're, you, don't, you don't have it right here. Uh, and you of, don't get to redefine. And you don't get to redefine. Yeah. You don't get to redefine. One of the reasons why we, even in light of this world where people are pulling back on DEI, have decided to move forward with our center on diversity and equity and inclusion and hire an executive director is in part to say clearly, we at Oberlin are not going to let go of this value that we think is important. The, the way we define it is a value to not just the college, but to society. And so we embrace it and we're not going to move away from it because society is having a fad moment. Uh, because at the end of the day, this commitment to inclusion is about what's right for everyone. It's not some special group getting some special thing. Thank you. There is a reason why I feel like people miss when we just say DEI, and I don't even say when, when we say it, we have to understand why that was ever a thing, why we had to have diversity, equity, inclusion, what it meant to be locked out. It wasn't right. the quote was, let's just get a few black folk in this door. No, it was because those who were qualified and should have been coming to the door weren't coming through the door. And that's why these measures had to be put in place. I feel like that gets lost right. in this conversation of you know, what, let's go back to what was the purpose and right. is it still necessary? Well, I mean, you know, I was talking to the other college presidents and so almost everyone at that table was an historic first, right? And institutions that yes. were almost 200 plus years old. 
Uh, we're the example of why diversity and equity inclusion is of value. Just by that just number. By just, just, just like, just that should in the conversation yeah, just by right sitting there. there yeah, it was, it yeah. was an example that it's important because if, if not for commitment to that approach, those women wouldn't be sitting there. And I would submit to anyone watching all of those women that they have helped transform their institution in positive ways. Mm. And but for their leadership, there would be not just students of color on their campus, but all students would be closed off to possibilities Absolutely. because all of us need images to look to to know that what we want to achieve is possible. When barriers are broken, when barriers are broken, everyone is better off. Everyone mm. is better off. And all of those women in those institutions have helped transform them because of their presence and because of their leadership. Mm. There was a stat that came out years ago from the World Economic Forum, and it talked about what I call it, what happens when a woman walks through the door. Mm. And it said that countries, nations and countries, literally lose billions of dollars when they do not invest in their women and in their children. Absolutely. They you are leaving money on the table when you choose not to bring women to the table. And I, I wish that people would really understand the what women really bring to the table. And in the report, it talked about how communities grow better, uh, how nations grow better, and right. it pointed to several uh, women in leadership. And I Same thought thing about that in college with the campus. education of children, right? Yes. So, you know, all sorts of data, mortality rates, go all of those things that we know are important, when you educate a mother, a woman, you yes. educate children, educational attainment goes up. So yes. it's to ignore women, to ignore women of color is to the world's detriment. Um, this is right. not some special thing we're doing it's just not to for help us. people this out. This is for you. Yes, yes, like, right. You need me, actually. Yes. More than it's, you not need me. Need it's you. It's you. <laughs> it's not That's me. That's the conversation you. that needs to happen. There was a, uh, a, a dinner that was held by um, An Anita Hill. Yeah. And in this conversation, she, you know, convened some women. But it, just a few notes from it. One was um, the discrimination is, is not just who is given a chance, but also who is forgiven if they make a mistake. And in it, uh, she was talking about the need to fit in. And you talked about earlier um, ask, having to ask for permission to do certain things. Yeah. You know. you know, it's interesting. I have really moved away personally from this idea of fitting in. I love it. I think it's not the right framing. Okay. Because fitting in requires you to shift yourself. Mm. And what we want is affirmation. We want belonging, not to fit in. And I think when we on our campus, when we shift it from fitting in, let's make sure everybody fits in. That requires people to conform. Yeah, and who are we, who's what are we, are we conforming, conforming to? to? So let's talk about making sure people belong. Everybody belongs. Yes. Everybody matters. And if we can create communities and systems that support mattering and affirmation, then we know we've arrived. I love so much, so many gems that you've dropped. And as we kind of bring it to a close, I want to talk about um, just next steps and legacy for you. Mm. What is it? What is the footprint that you want to leave at Oberlin College and, and for everyone, period? Yeah. You know, Oberlin is such a special place. I love Oberlin College. It, it has this long, deep, rich history of being a thought leader um, and making a difference in higher education and really the world because of who we've been. And so I really want my legacy to just ensure that we are still in that space, like making a significant difference in what happens because we're there. And so the center is a part of that, right? It's about launching these students out to change the world for good. Um, and I want my legacy to be in keeping with the historic nature of this institution. Um, that when my time is done, uh, that people will say that um, she served the institution well, 
and she ensured that it continued for years and years to come in these historic and powerful ways. I came to Oberlin because of its historic legacy. I came to Oberlin because there's things I care about in the world that I want to talk about, and I know that if you're at Oberlin, people will care about it um, because of how special this institution is. So I know that I have a different platform. When I talk about diversity and equity and inclusion, people will care because we're at Oberlin. Um, when we talk about uh, climate change, um, we have this historic project yes. that means we're going to be carbon neutral by 2025. Um, people will care about it. And um, Oberlin is a place where uh, people care about what happens at our institution. And I'm hopeful that my legacy is that we continue to be that um, bellwether institution. So goes Oberlin, so goes higher education. And what about the legacy for the pathway forward in leadership for other college presidents? You know what? We spend, sometimes because of the pressures of the job, uh, we spend time talking about the challenges. And it's fair to talk about the challenges because I don't want anyone to think that they're not, it's not challenging roles. But there is so much joy in these roles, too. Mm. And part of what I think we have to demonstrate to the next generation of young black women leaders, because that's what we're talking about today, is that there's joy in this ability to help shape and move an institution. You can have an impact on the next generation of leaders in a way that makes them imagine what's possible in a different way. Like I know mm. that just my presence on that campus helps all types of students. When they go and see the pictures on the wall of the past presidents, they walk boom, 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 and they're going to get to mine. Oh my goodness! And know that something has shifted. Something shifted. Something shifted. <laughs> And I hope for them they think not only did something shift on this campus for her, but something shifted on this campus for me, for them. The possibility shifted. That's what I hope my legacy is, that how you imagine yourself can be. That can be. I love it. I love it. I love the vision that you are creating uh, for so many to, that will come behind you. Woo! President Ambar, thank you so much for joining me on the record today. And I actually want you to come back and talk with me again. Oh, about... I would love to. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for joining us on today. Of course.